You need to do better. Right now. Yes or no? You're killing him! Their hearts are barely pumping. Their lungs are shot. Now they're showing liver toxicity. Damn, so the patients are now going into multi-organ failure. Very excited to react to House MD Season 1, Episode 8, Poison. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in the UK. We're reacting to all the House episodes and this will be Episode 29 out of 177. I, I need to use the monk room. The bathroom? Don't stink up till I kill you. He's really sick. Get some help. All right, so the patient fell to the ground, but there was no limb jerking or loss of consciousness. He seemed to have a warning that he wasn't gonna be feeling too well soon and was sweaty. The amount of things that could cause this are huge, but generally he's young in school, could be infectious like meningitis or encephalitis, infectious mononucleosis, <laughs> or kissing disease, could have HIV and associated cerebral complications. The episode is also called poison, and it seemed like the patient was hallucinating, could be mandrake, nightshade, or jimson poisoning. Need some clues to narrow this down. Heart race down to 48 and falling fast. He's not responding to atrophy. He's a teenager. It's drugs. His tox screen was negative. His intrinsic CAT scan was clean. There's no sign of an infection. Oh, so there's some clues here. So my biggest suspect right now is poisoning and a specific type called organophosphate poison. It's a very interesting toxin and has been used as a nerve agent in the past. The people most commonly affected are farmers as it is in some insecticides. It works by blocking an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that breaks down a neurotransmitter that stimulates the rest and digest nervous system. Without that enzyme, the rest and digest nervous system goes into overdrive, producing things like diarrhea, anxiety, low heart rate, sweating, nausea, small pupils, muscle tremors, and confusion. Seems to match all the patient's symptoms here. You can diagnose it by checking plasma cholinesterase levels and treat using atropine, pralidoxine, and benzodiazepines like diazepam. Usually large amounts of atropine are needed and that might be why it's not working in this case. You start with one milligram and then keep doubling until you get to even 32 milligrams for a dose. Doesn't seem like Foreman has done that quite here though. What's the differential for negative tox screen? He was clean. Unless someone screwed up the test. Or he OD'd on something we didn't test for. One for butane dial would give you these symptoms. Copy machine toner. Find his stash. You probably haven't heard of 1,4-butanediol, but it's a pro-drug in the body and it's converted to something you probably have heard of called GHB. It's actually causing huge problems in the party culture with three to four patients on average in A&Es across the UK attending each week and similar numbers throughout the developed world. It's also rising in popularity in recent years since it's cheap and gives people the feeling of euphoria. If you're ever at a party and you see someone going unconscious, that's more than likely to be GHB. Theoretically, it could cause the patient's symptoms here, but usually you get rapid recovery after ingesting GHB, and this patient seems to be unwell even after being in hospital for about a day. Most patients with GHB overdose actually get discharged from A&E rather than being admitted to a highly specialized diagnostician. Interestingly though, it's usually missed from the first drug screens and it takes about a few days for it to come back once the clinicians test for it. Guys, um, 10 milligrams, so. Right, what's going on? So he's seizing. Help me hold him. cool, mate. Calm me down. It seems in season one, the budgets for the medical consults weren't quite as high as they were in later seasons, as there are a few errors here to point out. Firstly, Chase wants to give diazepam as soon as the seizure starts, which can actually worsen outcomes by reducing the heart's ability to cope with the extra pressure from the seizure. You should wait about five minutes before giving pharmacotherapy for a seizure, as 97% will self-terminate within five minutes. You should also never try and hold someone who's having a seizure that resistance makes them more likely to injure something, like have a shoulder dislocation or broken bone. Putting them onto their side gently is what you can and should do to avoid them choking on their tongue. The other thing is that when Chase tells the patient to stay cool, 
There really isn't much point in that as the patient has no control over the seizure and is also unconscious. Chase must be that guy who likes speaking on a Zoom call with his microphone muted. But I really don't think this is GHB as it couldn't cause this repeat acute deterioration like we've seen. Drugs of abuse are unlikely here. But I have a question for you smart people, off the top of your head. Which are the three most commonly abused prescription drug types? Drop your answers below. Mom's not too careful with the homemade tomato sauce. When the top sticks out like that, it's a sign of bacterial contamination. This one's open. Source of botulism, as well as a million other toxins that cause gastroenteritis. Oh, this tomato sauce probably isn't the cause either. If it were contaminated with botulism, a dose is severe enough to cause seizure, it wouldn't be so slowly progressive. The patient also doesn't have any signs of diarrhea or vomiting, which would be expected from foodborne contamination. Now it's time to be thinking what toxic substances could lead to this response. Could still be organophosphate poisoning, but also nickel poisoning has been reported to cause seizures like this. Also methanol, lithium, and something called domoic acid that you can get from shellfish. This is a really tough case. Don't. Kid just started seizing, not a symptom of foodborne toxins. Pesticide poisoning or organophosphates, organochlorines. I love how House just ate the tomato sauce like, yeah, easy peasy. A life of hospital food has given him a titanium stomach. Now it's taken House's team 10 minutes to come up with my diagnosis. Where's my job off at Universal Studios? If you're wondering about the difference between organophosphates and organochlorines, Welcome to the deep end. Organochlorines cause slightly different symptoms in poisoning like incoordination, mental confusion, myoclonic jerk movements, and tonic-clonic convulsions. Interestingly, these seizures can occur up to 48 hours after exposure and can even recur after. It's extremely rare and it's usually confirmed by a gas liquid chromatographic exam of the blood, and that test is only offered in a very small number of labs. There's no specific antidote, but one very interesting treatment point is not to give oils or fat to the patient, as organochlorines are very lipophilic compounds, so if you have fat in the gut, it actually increases the absorption of the organochlorines. I still do think that the organophosphates are more common and were more likely to fit with the symptoms of this case. It's an organophosphate. Breath 30, ready cardiac arrest, get me the pads. We're gonna bait his heart for him. This is actually a thing, it's called external pacing and is very brutal. Repeat electric shocks to the patient to regulate their heartbeat and stimulate the natural pacing of the heart. A few things have also happened here. The patient seems to have confirmed organophosphate poisoning on the blood test and is on pralidoxime, which opposes the effect of organophosphates, but it doesn't seem to be working for them. One thing that doesn't quite make sense here is that his blood pressure and heart rate have been low for ages now. They've been giving him tons of atropine and he's being managed on an open ward. We can see that because people are casually walking around in the background and they're not wearing any scrubs. Also, there are windows. In a hospital, there is level one care, which is an open ward, level two care, which is a high dependency unit, and level three care, which is the intensive treatment unit. This guy needs ITU care as he's been unwell for so long, he's now having seizures and is basically comatose. Also, when externally pacing someone, you want to give sedation. That's because electrocuting someone repeatedly has the surprising effect of waking them up. And being shocked repeatedly while awake doesn't sound like a fun way to spend a Saturday. Are there any stronger treatments for the organophosphate poisoning? One of my professors at Columbia developed an experimental treatment for the arm. There's a different hydrolase treatment for each poison. There's over 40 organophosphates. I get all of them. You may be wondering why treatment for pesticide poisoning is useful for the army, and it has a very interesting history. After the First World War, Germany became very aware that its food supply could be barricaded quite easily. That means that one failed crop harvest could spell disaster for its army. Pests were a huge risk for that failed harvest and conventional pesticides were hard to get so there was a need for a new type of pesticide. So a guy called Gerhard Schroeder who was a chemist was tasked with creating this new type and he ended up creating thousands of chemicals including those of the organophosphate class most of which were totally useless. One of them was called LE100 which was made in 1936 and killed 
all of his in trial aphid insect, even when it was diluted. It was so potent, they actually made Schroeder himself quite ill and landed him in hospital. He thought it was useless because of how deadly it was, but thought maybe if it were more diluted, then it could be useful. So he sent it off for safety testing, and even in its diluted form, it killed guinea pigs, killed an imported ape from Spain, and it killed basically all the test animals. So Berlin became very interested in this, and that agent became known as Tabu, which was an intersection between cyanide chemistry and organophosphate chemistry. And to this day is one of the most toxic known nerve agents used for chemical warfare. There are many other organophosphates used in chemical warfare, and some are so deadly that they are classed as weapons of mass destruction by the United Nations. So now you know why the army are interested in antidotes, but here's the real question. Why do they not just keep doubling the atropine dose? Then you wouldn't need a specific antidote, but that would be boring. If we figure out how he got exposed, we'll figure out what he was exposed to. Thinking maybe homemade tomatoes? Front yard vegetable garden. I'll check into it. I'll keep the kid alive. Can you turn off the pad? There's only so long you can be recurrently electrocuted for, so Chase is fitting a pacemaker, which is usually done by a cardiologist, to try and help the heart continue at its normal rate with just localized electricity that doesn't shock his whole body. The team now think the organophosphate may be coming from the patient's vegetable garden, and if they find out the specific pesticide, then they can get the experimental antidote for it. If you're enjoying this content, then you can support me to make it even better by joining as a member. Not only does it help me a lot, but it also gives you special perks like being able to recommend an episode and getting early access to new videos. Press join to secure your spot now. I found the pesticide. It's Diesel Photon. He used up the whole can. This should bomb with it and neutralize the poison. But there was no Diesel in that can. Yes, they weren't allowed to use pesticide. Oh, this is getting quite interesting. They found what they think is the pesticide Side, but it was just a reused can. Kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and I used to go to a freezer, see an ice cream box, and then open it up and there was meat inside. So disappointing. Now they're gonna give him this antidote when this is definitely not the pesticide he had taken and it's probably gonna make him worse. Maybe he went to an abandoned battle zone and accidentally reactivated some nerve gas. That would be spicy. We've got a problem. Heart rate's 49, O2 stat, 84 and falling. His name is Chi Ling. Identical symptoms as Matt. They live 10 miles apart, don't even know each other. Ghost chili levels of spicy. This just made my nerve gas theory rocket up in likelihood. Now the question is, how would two guys who live 10 miles apart, who don't know each other, be exposed to the same nerve agent? It would need to be somewhere remote, otherwise the numbers would be way higher, like exploring an old abandoned warehouse, a haunted house, or even an empty warehouse. Maybe they were playing scientists, trying to cook up some crystal meth, accidentally made mustard gas. Let's get some clues. Same school, different grades, different cliques, different everything. How do they get to school? We need to test the bus for chemical residue. Did you happen to notice if anyone was doing any spraying near the bus route? There was this truck down by the pond doing something or other. Both kids got poisoned on the bus? What about all the other kids? What about the driver? Could it be that just those two had their windows open while this toxin was being sprayed? Also, for this exact reason, there is a health and safety board that requires everyone who works with industrial pesticides to register to show that they're competent and know how to reduce pesticide drift. This is a real problem though, and there have been many cases, notably in San Joaquin Valley in California, where people have been unwell because of this. It's estimated that around half of all pesticide illness in agricultural workers actually is because of pesticide drift. They sprayed ethyl parathion right next to the bus route. So you have the hydrolase for ethyl parathion? Yeah, only one problem. Matt's mother faxes records to the CDC. She refuses to let us do anything until she hears back from them. I can totally understand the mother's concern here. The doctors were wrong once. Why trust them again? It's so hard to renew confidence in healthcare after an error happens. And actually getting a second opinion or switching provider is probably a good idea after a bad experience like that. The difficulty though is in the acute setting where there is a life on the line and that hesitation is what's stopping the patient from getting better. This reminds me of a case when I was on pediatrics. A mother brought a newborn child of two weeks old in to the pediatric emergency department. The child was clearly unwell and needed an IV line and lumbar puncture with IV antibiotic. In a situation like this, the child has presumed sepsis 
and could have meningitis. Every second counts. The mother disagreed with those interventions and stopped us from proceeding with any of the tests or treatments. I saw her first. She then got a second opinion from my registrar and needed a third from the consultant, which is the equivalent of an attending. Then she called her family in Australia. She called her family in New Zealand. And then the attending had to come and discuss with them all. And after all of that, she wanted to transfer to a different hospital. It was only at the point where we wanted to get the hospital legal team and social services involved that she then decided to let us go ahead with the investigations. And it's a good thing she did as her child did actually have sepsis and needed those antibiotics urgently to save their life. I'm thinking about transferring that. He won't survive a transfer. They send a single woman to hustle the single mom. Actually, they sent a doctor. If your son doesn't get this treatment, he'll die. I remember entering the first year of med school thinking, why do we need communication skills training? This is why. When a patient or relative is angry or upset or scared, we need to be able to deal with that and not take it personally. It's hard not to though, especially when someone is hurling abuse at you. And if there's anyone who takes a significant amount of abuse, it's healthcare professionals. Don't take my word for it though. A recent YouGov poll showed that a third of patient facing NHS healthcare professionals had actually experienced physical violence at least once a year. That poll also assessed how many of them had experienced aggressive behavior and that was two thirds of the patient facing NHS professionals. Now I've personally seen this as well as a healthcare assistant that I used to work with was actually punched by a patient in the hospice when she was trying to take him a cup of tea. Dealing with vulnerable patients that may be confused or intoxicated definitely increases this risk dramatically as well. My heart goes out to all of the healthcare professionals who have experienced abuse and Hope that you can hang in there. Thank you for your service. You need to do better, right now. Yes or no? You're killing him! Their hearts are barely pumping. Their lungs are shot. Now they're showing liver toxicity. Damn, so the patients are now going into multi-organ failure from what they thought was ethylparathion, but now their specific experimental antidote isn't working. Makes sense that it isn't parathion though, as it's now banned because of its high toxicity. Now the blood results were positive for organophosphates, so we know they're in there, but what if the real poisoning is something else? Something causing both of their symptoms? There was a study done in neurotoxicology in 2010 that showed that the activity levels of acetylcholine esterase were altered by mercury and lead presence in a zebrafish. So what if it's heavy metals and pesticides? House is always looking for zebras. Does a zebrafish count? Go to their houses, check for anything that might have touched their skin between the time they got off and the time they went to school. TKO. TKO. Environmentally safe formula. The ones he wore today, yes, never washed. Oh my god, so they found the one product that was the same for both of them. And they didn't use it. Anyone else would have given up at this point, but not House. A little medical uncertainty ain't gonna stop him. I also love Cameron's character development in this episode. It's the first time we've seen her really step up and defend herself after the mother was aggressive with her. What about Matt's clothes? Were they new? Fake old. Hundred dollars for the homeless look. She was wearing a different brand. How could they both have been contaminated? Fostrin. Hit him with the hydrolate. They found it! Fostrin is the trade name, but Mevinfos is the generic name of the compound. It's an organophosphate insecticide that contaminated the patient's clothes. This is why you're always advised to wash new clothes before wearing them, as they're treated to stop them getting damaged, or creased in transit. Also dyes from the clothes can move to your skin. This is especially important with baby clothes as I've realized recently with a baby on the way as baby skin is much more sensitive and requires much smaller doses of chemical to do harm. Now is the mum actually gonna let them treat Matt? That's the question. What makes you think you're right this time? Same reason as last time. Make a decision with it. The CDC is unable to give an opinion at this time, man. We fooled her with that. <laughs> Chase did a good impression there. He makes an excellent neurosurgeon, excellent cardiologist. He would make a really good actor. Now, Fostrin is technically a type of organophosphate. And I did say organophosphate right at the start, but not the exact one. Does that count as me guessing the diagnosis? I'll let you decide, comment below. Now cure the boy so he can go eat that homemade pasta sauce. 
You could stay in bed and work on your applications. Some guy was selling pants off the back of his truck. He did day labor at a cornfield out of Route 1. Ah, that's how the pants got poisoned. There you have it. Never buy pants from the back of a truck. I also love how the patient's mom was like, you almost died. You can stay in bed. Don't worry. And work on your application. She's a tough cookie, but hey, so was Richard Branson's mom who made him walk four miles to his grandma's house when he was acting up in the back of her car. Look how he turned out. But how does the next episode turn out? Do I get the diagnosis? Find out here. Stay curious.